Welcome to Shades of Impact. This is a um, live stream series that the Surge Institute is doing in order to kind of build some informal dialogue. Um, the Surge Institute is a national organization, a nonprofit that serves um, people of color and uh, develops, edu uh, develops, elevates, and connects um, education leaders who are trying to transform the education space. Um, I want to thank everyone who's able to join us for joining us. And um, if you're just signing in, we're just getting started. Um, my name is Chris Paisley. I'm the VP of Marketing for uh, Surge. Um, I've been with Surge for three years. Um, and this is a project I'm really excited about because it affords a space for folks who are part of this community to engage in the same type of dialogue that we usually have um, behind closed doors and put it in a public space. Um, this is an opportunity for us to have some real talk about everything that's going on right now um, and also just connect with each other and connect with you all. So um, if you're just joining us, please feel free to comment, um, share this uh, with anybody you think might be interested in watching. Um, and I'll be monitoring the comments so that we can respond to some of those. Um, but in the meantime, I want to just introduce you to these three brothers, um, David, Brian, and Harold. Um, David, you want to start us off just giving a quick introduction um, and tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, sure. appreciate the invite. Um, as you said, my name is David Abdullah Muhammad. Uh, I am currently the executive director and head youth instructor at Integrity Martial Arts Academy. Um, I taught high school uh, and middle school for 11 years, um, social studies. And I'm also going to be um, re-entering the classroom this year uh, at a school called Kansas City Girls Preparatory Academy, where I'll be teaching uh, martial arts as an enrichment class. So um, truly a full-time martial arts instructor. Um, and then along with that, I'm a, I'm a husband and a father to two um, lovely little girls. So. Awesome. Thank you. Brian, go ahead and tell us about yourself. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, so my name is Brian Harris. I am currently a post-secondary coach um, within Chicago Public Schools, um, as well as transitioning into a hybrid role where um, I'm going to be serving as a post-secondary specialist for the Gear Up Grant within the Office of Counseling and Post-Secondary Advising within Chicago Public Schools. Um, I've been um, working as a post-secondary coach for entering my ninth year. Um, now, um, I also um, serve in a couple other, you know, sm uh, smaller capacities. Um, I, I do a lot of data work um, within our grant. Um, and then um, I've also supported um, in a couple of the past couple of years, um, the uh, CBS, the Chicago Public Schools Men of Color Summit that we put on uh, every year serving uh, hundreds of, of black and brown um, males across the city. Thanks, brother. Harold, go ahead. Where are you coming from? Uh, coming from Oakland, California. Um, serving as uh, Teddy Riley tonight. We've got a couple of uh, um, <laughs> uh, with the technology, but Harold Pearson, I'm the CEO of uh, SPAT, the program for academic and athletic transitioning to support high school and middle school student athletes and being prepared for college, career, and life after sports. Um, was a collegiate, um, high school and collegiate athlete uh, growing up, went to UC Berkeley, got a chance to see the whole gamut um, of college sports um, and wanted to, you know, uh, fill in the gaps where some of some of the gaps that I had and, and family and friends that I had. And so we co-founded an organization from, uh, about 17 years ago. And so I am the CEO, I'm the janitor the grant writer, uh, the program uh, person. And so, um, yeah, got a, um, I'm also a husband and a father, got two kids. I'm also a new a newly found teacher. So I'm, I'm doing homeschool with the seven elementary, seven year old and four year old at the house. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Um, yeah, Harold was, we've had some difficulty getting a video of Harold. So, um, David will have to hold down the Bald Brothers with beards. Um, there you go. There you got me. <laughs> hey, you know what I'm saying? Hey. <laughs> right on the top, heavy on the face. You know how it go. There it is. <laughs> uh, don't know how we do it, Dave. Yeah. Let's see, uh, a few folks have joined us. Um, if y'all don't mind throwing in a comment saying hi, um, we're just getting started right now. Um, be a part of the dialogue because um, in a, in a 
in a little bit, we'll be, you know, taking some questions, engaging with y'all. Um, but just to kick things off, I want to ask y'all uh, a really challenging question. What are you listening to? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I want you to kick us off, Brian. You look like you already know. You look like this this could be easy for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I feel like I listen to 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 always a little bit of everything. Um, the one constant in my life is Big Crit. Um, hey. Hey. Who, who, hey. Yeah, it is is something I'm always listening to. Um, definitely love Southern hip hop in general. Um, yeah, other than that, a little little bit of everything. I've, I've uh, recently started on um, uh, uh, Lucky Day, a little bit of R and B. All right, too. Um, so yeah, I would say say those are the main two. Yeah, at this point, you can't go wrong with Big Crit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, huge Crit fan. Where you at, David? Yeah, man. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna be that guy and first plug myself. Hey. I'm, I'm currently working on a couple of different projects, hip hop projects. So I've been listening to some different mixes and stuff of things I've recorded, but I'm not going to belabor that. That can be part of the conversation later. Um, <laughs> but um, Sky Vu, um, he's a rapper out of New York, real yeah. lyrical cat. Um, he just dropped a, a Father's Day EP, which is mm. phenomenal. Um, and a few, about two months ago, he dropped uh, a jazz inspired hip hop album called The Bluest Note, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I'm a big Black Thought fan. I think Black Thought is the greatest rapper of all time. So I'm always tapping into him um, and the roots. Um, yeah. Black Thought just did a, a Tiny Desk concert from home, which is crazy. Um, he did a Tiny Desk, the NPR thing? Yeah, but he did it at his house and it was nuts. It was That's nuts. wild. <laughs> he just killed it, you know? And um, and then from there, when I feel like getting grimy and like angry, I'm on this Griselda. I don't know if y'all down with like West Side Gun and Conway the Machine. Mm -hmm. hey. Nothing positive about what they talking about, but I know. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. And then uh, lastly, this new Anderson Pack joint has been stuck mm. in my head. He just dropped a new track, and I I can't get it out of my head. It's it's, it's crazy. So yeah, man, yeah. But uh, some new some new brother news coming somewhere. Oh, yeah, to tap into. Yeah, we'll we'll get we'll yeah we'll get into that. Anderson Pack is my substitute for Andre three thousand. When Man. <laughs> whenever he gets gets off his butt and starts doing some more stuff, you know. That's when they have together. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 What you got, Harold? Man, uh, I'm old school, man. So, um, well, I, I I got two I got two genres I'm I'm on right now. The first one is um, the uh, the Trolls two soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, so I'm bumping all of that, you know. That's that's twenty four seven, and then right. um, I've been I, I was looking up uh, changes by Tupac yesterday. So I'm on I'm on nineties man. 90s, I, you know, I, I try to connect. I connect with some of our guys now, but it, it's hard for me to get, get with it. But um, yeah, no, um, you know, I was just listening to some of the lyrics last night and. I see no changes. All the seasons, racist faces, misplaced, yeah. make, misplaced hate, Thanks. makes disgrace the races. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, just everything you got in here, man. He just he just laid out the whole thing like it was yesterday. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, that, that troll too was hot in the streets now, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know how you know how Spotify hey. tell you what you've been listening to for the year. My my last year one was like. All this hip hop and then like descendants of yeah. it's in a frog. You know, I'm like, dang, I hope my boys don't see this. I can't even talk to you. <laughs> like my top ten is like half like Mary Poppins. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I had a good I had a good mix of J. Cole and um uh the Lego movie too soundtrack. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. You know, Tiffany Haddish got a couple joints on there. Yeah, don't sleep on it. <laughs> Three soundtrack. Well, hey. that. <laughs> That's what's up. Um, all right, cool. Well, um, I guess we can get into the to the to the real talk. Um, I mean, I think what I really wanted us to to get a chance to to talk talk about is just where we are. You know, how are we feeling right now? Um, we are in 
I don't know how many weeks into COVID life, um, which is kind of ebbing and flowing and changing constantly. Um, but we're also, you know, in the the wake of some some uh, serious civil unrest that is that has been brought on by the um, by more murders, to be quite frank, to to um, by more of the same. Um, and so I, I'll. I'll say I'm in a place of both frustration and inspiration. Um, but I just want to hear from y'all. Like, how, where, where are you at? How are you feeling? We can start with Harold this time. If you... Oh, Harold. Uh... Oh, we lost Harold. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on, Harold. There he is. Hey. Oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Now we got it. Okay. All right. See, now it's a party. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, missed, I missed the question. What was, what was the question? It's where we at? How we feeling with everything going on? Um, you know, week umpteenth of COVID plus, uh, you know, where we are just with all the civil unrest and the the, the murders and um, the questions about what go what happens in the future with the police and everything, all that, but um, really just tapping into how y'all feeling um, in the midst of all this. Yeah, man, it's it's uh it's it's tough right now, man. So it's it's a lot of it's a lot of feelings right now. Um, just personally, you know, just seeing everything that's going on and the protests wanting to get active, you know, um, wanting to do, I'm a, I'm an action oriented person. So I'm like, man, what, what can I do to jump in there? You know, we got, we got, we, we've been seeing this. First of all, welcome everybody to the party. We've been, we've been in this party for a minute. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, welcome, welcome and uh, welcome to America. And, um, you know, just looking at, you know, myself, what can I do about it? Us as a people, you know, I was talking to a brother the other day and, you know, we kind of agreed that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of ready for this. We're, we're, we're super ready for this moment, but then we're also kind of not ready for this moment. And so what, what is our next step? What is our, um, what are we going to do next? What is our demands? What, what is the, the list of things that we need to accomplish? Um, for me, education is really ground zero. And so um, looking at, you know, the, the 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 impact I can have, the reach that I have, the capital that I have, and how I can be most effective, um, and then you know, you know, how do I protect my family? You know, how to protect my kids, and um, you know, I I I I got my my license my license the other day, uh, a couple months ago. Um, I am a, a lawful gun owner at this point, you know, and just to you know being always mindful of you know what's going on and this is with the covid situation so now yeah. the you know the george floyd situation kind of um it amplifies everything so um yeah man now was that this was all this what provoked you to to make that choice to get your license and everything or was it already something in the, you know you was working toward i mean i was i was thinking about it but you know when the covid covid kicked off and um, it was just like, man, hey, if, if some, if, if we go into some world war or you know uh, uh, just chaos everywhere, and you know what are we gonna do to protect ourselves? And um, you know, prevention is the first thing for me. So uh, if they hear the click clack, they you know less likely to come up in here. Um, so you know, just want to you know always thinking ahead, and you know, as men, that's you know that's our natural you know role is is to be the protector and for you know safety first. That's what I tell my kids, safety first. So um, yeah. that's that's what I'm thinking about, and that's what I was thinking about before. And then you know the George Floyd thing kind of just put it in perspective, and um, you know uh, we and we what we need to do as a community, we need to get proactive in protecting our communities, protecting our women. Um, yeah. than our kids. I hear that. How y'all feel about that? Yeah, man, it's real with the gun talk. You know, I mean, uh, I kind of go back and forth on the idea of carrying sometimes because it's like, I'll be like, man, no, ma no matter how many guns we got, they got 
man, they blow us out the water. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I I, I think about like what Breonna Taylor, right? Like he was lawfully carrying. They came up on him. He was trying to protect his, his girl and then they killed her. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, look at Fred Hampton. You know, they, they Black Panthers care. They went in there and, you know, and so like sometimes I'm like, you know, I think about how would America respond if black people start caring openly, like for real, you know, like it would get nuts, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so I try to, um, trying to find that balance, you know what I mean? But at the same time, like Harold mentioned, like initial instinct is like, I got to take care of my family, man. I got to take care of my seed and no amount of karate in the world <laughs> is going to, you know, fight them all off. But uh, I also know like the, the police are a military. They are they are military, and you kill right. one white civilian, and you got, uh, you know, an entire army literally coming at you, yeah. um, and, and with with now at this point what they consider to be just cause. So, you know, it's I don't know. Man, I feel that. Um, yeah. I, I I've had some similar mental tug of war happening in terms of how to protect my family, all that kind of stuff. Um, how you feel, Brian? I mean, like everybody else, I, uh, I mean, probably any black person in the country, in the world, I feel a lot of ways at all times. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling Harold. I've definitely, um, I was, I was definitely the one that, that, um, really had considered or that really had considered carrying and it is now on my to-do list to go with my concealed carry. Um, it is actively on my to-do list. But um, I, I would say, um, Chris, you you mentioned the murders, um, and I don't know which murders you were necessarily um, referencing. But if I'm, you know, thinking about what's what's heaviest on my heart, it's just murders in general, right? Um, yeah and it's not just one type right it's it's the intercommunity violence and and before i continue because when you talk about intercommunity violence i feel like you have to preface because people try to flip it into some what about black on black black on black crime shit. That, that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about because it's because it's all a product ultimately of white supremacy right um you know that being said 100 people shot this weekend um, and I'm thinking about young people in that, you know, I, I, I know one of the, or I, I don't want to say I know in terms of like I'm, I'm in community with, but um, one of the perpetrators absolutely was, was the former student. Um, just heard today, a, a recent graduate shot six times. Um, so just the urgency of this moment, I think, to tie it all together is is, is what I'm feeling. Um, and you know, again, not that these were ever not problems, because just because people paying attention now doesn't mean that people weren't experiencing and thinking about it before. Yeah. At the same time, I do see this as an opportunity to bring some, you know, bring some more people in and, and give people that sense of urgency that, uh, that we kind of always feel that's real man um yeah when i say murders i'm talking about police murders um of black men of black women um and uh you know civilian murders too like Mm -hmm. um, odd arbery um i was i was uh i went for a run for the first time in a while an embarrassing amount of time (laughs) Uh, last, last week and um i just ended up writing this this article on medium about it because it was like to go for a run is a white privilege um and i was trying to figure out why my head was where it was and it was partially you know in the back of my head uh thinking of a mod arbery but uh it's always been there. Like, oh, I need to make sure I have my ID on me in case, you know, 
I need to work make sure I look like a runner, like I'm wearing the right clothes so that I look like a runner. You know, all these weird little things that I have to do to not only protect myself, but keep, you know, thinking about my family and what happens if, if I don't come home. Um, it's wild, man. Uh, Andres uh, shared a, <clears throat> a link in the chat about the National African-American Gun Association. Um, this is an organization I didn't even know existed, to be honest. Um, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, so look into it more, but it looks to be, you know, centered around what we're talking about right now, which is um, the specific, unique value of us protecting ourselves and our families. Um, and it's kind of interesting that we've all had this, we've reached this point where we're kind of thinking about, do we need to control carry? Do we need to carry guns? Uh, because I used to say literally like, you know, six months ago, I, I was like, you know, it wasn't where I was at, but I, I was driving in the car with my brother one day and my brother was in the military. So he, he keeps a gun and he got on me for not having one. He was like, man, you got to. And it just feels like it keeps coming back in one way or another. So I don't know where I am with it yet. Yeah. You know. It's a conflict, man. Like a, my pops always told me, you know, a gun don't keep you from getting shot. You know what I'm saying? That's one thing. Yeah. And uh if you, if you carry, you have to be ready to do what it was built to do. You know what I'm saying? And like I feel like this the you know, the self-defense has to happen on two things. It has to happen on the the self-protection stuff, like so you know, taking care of yourself physically. You know, regardless of whatever that means to you, but it also has to be in like correcting the climate to be preventative for sure. You know, like true prevention is like changing mindsets to where we don't even have to get that far. You know what I'm saying? And um, that's what I hope we can have right now is like more, more conversation, more opportunities to grow and heal some of these mindsets so that we not provoke to even get there. Because the real talk is like, if black people start killing whites, it's the narrative's gonna be bad, and yeah. the response is gonna be worse. You know what I mean? And um, because like you, you know, go to like, oh, what about black and black crime? That's <laughs> when, first of all, you know, crimes are a matter of proximity. People like they don't call it white on white crime, right. but people right. who and commit crimes against those who they live near. That's the first thing. Yeah. Second, it's the assumption that like blacks are not talking about black on black crime. We've been fighting against black on black crime since its inception, right? So, you know, and the people who are protesting and saying Black Lives Matter are not the ones killing black folks. Right. You know, it's not like they're going off and like doing black <laughs> black shootings and then going and protesting and saying Black Lives Matter because a white cop, you know, did it. You know, yeah. they're not the same same people. You know, so um, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like um, I'm hesitant to carry just because I know the narrative, man. Like what what the response would be. I'm like, and my last name is Muhammad. Shoot, they'll be saying I'm a terrorist and <laughs> real talk, man. That's real though. Yeah, you ain't lying. That's real. That's real. Um, yeah, uh, I want to tap into that black on black crime argument that gets made way too often um first any if you i'm going to say it one more time if uh you are joining us um please feel free to share this stream with anybody you uh want to tune into it um and comment with any thoughts builds um on where we are in the conversation um yeah so black and black on black crime so this this guy posted uh that I, a friend of mine uh an older brother posted uh, basically saying like, yeah, we're protesting, you know, about the police killings and, uh, you know, all these kinds of things. But why are we not protesting black on black crime and business is getting trashed during all this and all this. And uh, my response was, you know, you don't protest things that are happening in your community. You protest when there's external forces that will not hear you unless you scream out 
um, whether it's the government or big businesses, you don't see, well, like if I go around my neighborhood protesting, you know, I mean, black on black crime or any of this, this stuff, who am I protesting to, you know? <laughs> um, but I'm just curious of y'all's thoughts when you hear this, cause this comes up literally every single time, right? This, what about black on black crime? Um, what is your response to that kind of thing? Because I'm 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 running out of ammunition. <laughs> well, for, I mean, first of all, I mean, honestly, my first response is dismissive because that means you don't really be with the peoples. Because if you are actually in the communities, I mean, I I I spend I live in South Shore, seventy first, and I spend most of well most of my non COVID days in Roseland. Um, it is plenty going, I mean, the, the, um, the disrespect that comes with the implication that in our communities where we are affected by violence, that we don't care about that violence, um, it, it, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And there is so much work being done and so much healing work being done um, to address the violence in the in the fundamental problem is 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 only us doing it and we, we don't get no help right yeah. so yeah this shit may not be on the news but it's constantly people working to broker peace it's constant we are the ones feeding our communities so that we not crabs in a barrel down here. Um, I mean, I've been a part of uh, grocery deliveries and, 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 it, and it don't be people, you know, these are not like things set up by uh, the government. It'd be people down here feeding people, right? Yeah. It'd be like, we're the ones educating our, you know, educating our kids. Um, so like again, I, I I just dismiss it. It's 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 you're not around to see the work that's 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 being done to address the needs of our community. And um, anybody that says that, I welcome them to come come help because it it the people that say that do not be the people who's ever doing anything. <laughs> that's real. Right, right, right. And it's you know it's a at the end of the day for me. I, you know I'm 100 percent with with Brian on um, his dismissing it is because it's to, is for white supremacists it's a, it's a market employee it's a, it's a way to to rebrand the conversation it's the way to to the same thing they did to Colin Kaepernick uh, it's, it's it's all about the flag they rebranded the whole campaign um the black panthers i mean it, it goes back i mean it's a market employee that's used over and over again to distract from the issue bring in a new issue and then and then we got division now people are confused not knowing what to do and so i think that you know we just we got to understand that it's kind of like we fall for a banana in the pail the banana in the tailpipe you know yeah. Um, here, here we go again with the with black on black, black crime, white, and then we're gonna talk about white on white crime. Now we're doing data dives into white on white crime and uh, <laughs> Mexican crime, and I mean, come on, man, we we know we know what's going on, and, and so stay focused. Here's what we're talking about. You know, we're talking about innocent black people being killed by the by police, lives being torn apart by this injustice, uh, by criminal justice system and just just ways to trap our community and so many people going to work on the ground for years they've been going on to work on the ground around mm -hmm. this, this 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 situation um i think the solutions you know the the economic solutions haven't been addressed and i think um you know we need to, we need to think about different economic solutions because at the end of the day i feel like you know everybody's battling over resources and if yeah. we have more resources to the table and we can control those resources, develop those resources ourselves, control the resources and sustain those resources, then we will have, we'll have a lot less crime. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, I really, y'all, y'all hitting it on the head and it, 
the more I sit and think about it, the more I'm like, you know, okay, if we look at the history, right, of like what got us to this point, right, like the why, and the communities where this black on black crime is happening, it they're doing exactly what they were built to do, right? Like the way that our communities have been separated from not even having grocery stores. You go into some of these schools, you, you, you know, a person with any kind of heart would tear up right away when you see the conditions of our schools and the lack of economic resources, you know, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do, right? And then if you think about the fact that no other neighborhood, no other community is as policed as heavily as the black community. So if we look at that, mm -hmm. technically, we should be the safest since we have the most policing. Since there's so much policing, yeah. right? Um, yeah. The police are supposed to serve and protect us. We should have the safest neighborhoods and we should have the best relationship with the police because they're around all the time, right? <laughs> and, and if you look right. at neighborhoods <laughs> where most are mostly white and are affluent, where there's less policing and kids are still selling drugs and stuff, it happens. For sure, I taught at an all-white school. They consume and they sell just as many drugs, and there's less policing. You should have more quote-unquote crime, right? And and it, it goes under the rug. So I, I think that that's part of the response too. Is like, okay, y'all coming down here, supposed yeah. to protect us, and y'all killing us. But then you want to divert the attention to us doing exactly what you built us to do. We mm -hmm. learned it from y'all. You know what I'm saying? You put right. drugs. And take out all the resources because we don't we don't have ships. We didn't go to Colombia and bring cocaine in. Right. We don't <laughs> how did it get there? Right. We don't we don't own any gun stores. So how did they all get here? Right? Yeah. Like, and so you put this stuff in our neighborhood and then you insulate it. What do you expect? Mm -hmm. You know. So right. I don't know. I, I again, like Brian and Harold mentioned, I, I ignore it because the people who are saying it, that's their way to not think about the reality of what just happened. Mm -hmm. you know like the fact of the matter is still a man died if you think that's justice if you think it was right then that's one thing but if you think it was wrong in the conversation why are we talking about something else let's talk about what's happening right now mm -hmm. that's real appreciate y'all um that that really helps um segue into uh a, a question that came up here in the um comments uh, from calvin uh does I love to hear you brothers comment on the relationship with the police and the black community. Do you feel that that relationship is now beyond repair? If so, your thoughts on the next phase of public safety? If not, what would the police department need to do in order to gain community trust? So I guess we can start there in terms of, do we feel like it's beyond repair? Do we feel like this kind of, this kind of tiptoes into, you know, the defund the police idea, I think, but, um, where are we sitting with that idea of that relationship being completely severed to, to the point of, you know, being beyond repair? Over, you know, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I don't see not the way it's currently constructed. I mean, they, they would just have to just re re like people say, you know, reimagine um, defund, I, you know, I don't know why I'm having a hard time with people saying defund the police department because I feel like that gives the the same people that say black on black crime is oh well, you just don't want police like nobody know nobody wants zero police but do we need <laughs> billions, billions of dollars? Well, hey, you might and that might be in well, Chicago. That's why we that's why we have this discussion. I'm like did that right. Right. And it's like um, it's a it's an allocation to, of resources. So 911, you know, if there's a cat in a tree, you know, you call the fireman, it's a fire. You, you know, the fireman shows up. If somebody's sick, the paramedic shows up. You know, if there is a mental health issue, somebody with, uh, you know, who's been on the job six months, who's holding a Beretta or some some military grade firearm and it's got a is not from the area not from chicago and you're going to insert them into that situation that's not a good idea that's a bad idea and so you're going to get what you want and so um unless we really look back to you know like david said around like where do we start if we started from slave patrols okay let's look <laughs> at that 
okay, where that where did that start? Okay, that's where it started. So are we doing are we doing the same thing? It sounds like we're doing the same thing. And now we, you know, we just have we got different folks doing now. Everybody's police Karen is police officers. They they policing every, everybody's policing us. What y'all doing? Where where you been? What you got in your pockets? What you doing over here? So I think that Man. you know, we need to yeah. we need to rethink that whole relationship and we we need to think about policing ourselves. You know, we need to police our own communities. We need to have young brothers and young sisters that can mobilize and, and the community. We can take care. We can take care of ourselves. We don't need people, other folks taking care of us. That's what's up. Um, Brian, you look like you, you, you was itching to say something there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. You know, I was again, this is the, the purpose of these conversations. So we get these perspectives out here because we, um, yeah. you know, we we want to build a collective understanding and in, in in a collective movement. Um, I mean, so so I, you know, I'll be transparent. This is a this is an abolition household. Um, my wife is. And I say that because my wife is literally upstairs um, uh, conducting a teaching on abolition. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> about that life. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, down over there today. <laughs> right, right, yeah. It just so happened these, you know, these calls were scheduled at the same, uh, at the same time, and um, yeah. So I'm, I'm pro police abolition, prison abolition, and and for me, what that, um, what that needs in, in response to the, or what that means in response to the original question, is I want to get out of the the narrative about it's, it's not about that. There's or at least for me my articulation of it. it's not about that there's oh there's so many bad cops that we can't repair the relationship is that the very the the function of the role for me is not designed to benefit black people right um harold speaks on the the origins of it in terms of you know they were originally sl slave patrols right police are police are um as a role as a function it's not about serving and protection. It's about keeping law and order. And black people are fundamentally illegal, right? In this society, we're the permanent underclass mm -hmm. society from the foundations of it, right? And so, anything that you know, when when our communities are not given the things to 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 function and to integrate into society, like anything that we that we do, our, our very nature is going to be illegal, right? Yeah. So. In my head, I understand that people are apprehensive when they hear defund and and um, abolition because their immediate thought is, we we're taking you know if we take away the police, like they they immediately think, okay, well that nothing is replacing it. No, we are calling in say in to say that all of the functions that the police are, that we're supposed to call the police for could be better served by something else, right? Mm -hmm. When we, we right. think about like, oh, we can we can protect ourselves. Well, there are systems, there, there's people who do not call the police, <laughs> right? Yeah. It, it, so people yeah, right. in the communities know, you know who to call if somebody, <laughs> if something is popping off on your block, if something is popping off in your house, we already have systems in place. Right. Yeah. Those are things that can be localized within our communities. Right. When we when we most violent crime that is committed, because uh, that's the crime that people most worry about. Right. So, like, you know, what happens? How do we protect people against domestic violence and, and, and things like that? Right. Mm -hmm. Think about what happens. The police, by and large. They're not preventing domestic violence. They're, they're they're punishing people who commit it. So the issue yeah. is why are people committing it in the first place, right? Yeah. yeah. I am saying that the resources that is spent on punishing people and disproportionately punishing black people, because as David said, the shit is going down in white communities as well. Right. Mm -hmm. 100%. And sometimes right. it, yeah, more so, right? Yeah. We 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 don't even we don't even criminalize certain white behaviors that are that are actually criminal right <laughs> morally, morally and based off of uh of the laws in our country right <laughs> yeah <laughs> we you know we it, i i think of my young people who who are some of the the 
you know, the people in the city who who experience the most hurt and as a result end up, hurt, I feel like, perpetuating hurt on each other often, right? And when a kid turns it around, it's never because, oh, we sent them to jail, now they come back. <laughs> Because some because we were able to call them in and help help heal them. We were to be able to help them work through something. They were they work with a great counselor, a great social worker, a great teacher. Mm-hmm. So I think we there are whole if we use our imagination, I think there are whole systems that we can create outside of of, of punitive practices that can help people keep people safe, which I think is the ultimate goal. Because I don't see policing as as doing that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, say something real quick because Chris Brian just brought it. Like he took us all to church mosque. So <laughs> that was that was heavy. You know, it, you would think, you know, because the people most afraid of this talk of defunding police or changing the idea of it is mostly the white community. They're the ones who get up in arms when you talk about this. Mm-hmm. You would think, right. by the way, they're afraid that we have a mass history of black and brown people attacking and killing white folks in this country. <laughs> Where and, right. and going to right. neighborhoods and right. raping their women and right. selling all their right. community drugs, right. like hmm. in what world, right? Like in like in the few moments where it's happened, you know, excuse me, in the in the few in the few times where it's happened, it's been eradicated right away, <laughs> you know, like they took care of it asap, right? But you look at we as a people were birthed out of violence. Like they brought us here violently. We've been massacred. Like <laughs> history has been destroyed. We got a little bit of reconstruction. Philadelphia built our own stuff. Bombed the crap out of that. Tulsa bombed and destroyed that. And we keep coming back saying, man, can we just have like, you know, I don't know, civil rights? Like we're not even asking for like right. civil. Like that's the most basic. And now, and now we're saying, you know what? Let us just police ourselves. Yeah. Let's just ourselves. Like, yeah. y'all go away. T- take the money. Y'all already took all the money. Take the cops too. We'll do it ourselves. Like we'll do you it. You know, like you would think they would be like, yeah, right away. And it just shows it's a deeper issue. It's a deeper issue uh, that isn't even real. It's based upon false narratives that yeah. go back to slavery, right? That like they painted the narrative that we were just savage, but they were the ones who were doing all of it. Yeah. I didn't get light skin because well, I'm not even gonna go there. But you know, we <laughs> put light skin on accident. I don't know. No. Like, yo, like, my parents are black, right? Oh, yeah. So, if you look at the history of rape, crime, drugs being dropped off in our neighborhoods, like these are evidence. You know, like, come on, yeah. man. Hoover Hoover said the biggest threat to the country was Negro unity. <laughs> like and he was president from the yeah. They killed all of our leaders. Like, what are we talking about here? So who should really be afraid of right. violence when all the guns were bought up at the beginning of coronavirus because they were afraid there was gonna be some kind of riot by black people? Like mm-hmm. we're not we're not blowing up y'all neighborhoods. We didn't go burn down the cop who killed George Floyd's house. So what are y'all tripping off of? Yeah, that's real, man. Man, y'all brothers are taking me some places. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this idea of even like black on black crime as a concern for people outside black communities is kind of funny to me. Like, why are you? Why do you? If 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 you are not a part of our communities, what's it to you? You know, and uh, this idea that mm, the police are supposed to stop this or that. Um, I'm curious if y'all, did y'all get a chance to watch the Dave Chappelle video? Yes. Yeah. I watched some of it. I didn't catch all of it, but yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't get a chance. Didn't get a chance. It was heavy. He, yeah, it's heavy. Definitely, I definitely recommend it to anybody who who hasn't seen it. But um, basically, he 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 gets into some of this stuff that we're talking about right now, um, and this idea that like even he brings up that the only time the NRA was for an assault rifle ban was when the Black Panthers was carrying yeah, yeah. to the state capitol, <laughs> and so the timing of you know the outrage 
and the the where the outrage is placed is um is definitely targeted and cultured and um that's real man uh so i'm curious but but low key low key i think one of the reasons that black lives matter movement is getting more traction now is that there is a little fear in place um not just by you know folks in the nra i'm talking about you know like white moderates white liberals Mm -hmm. oh snap like i think they really mad this time <laughs> That's real, man. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, right? Like, they should be glad we're asking for rights and not revenge. Mm. Like, if the same thing happened to their people in history, look what they've done when there's been one attack. Yeah. Not to take away the justice. Like, I'm not, like, 9 11 was wrong. Pearl Harbor was like, we can. But when there's been one attack on what they feel was their rights, they go to town. All 23, 23, 25 year war in Iraq. Dropping bombs. Yeah. I mean, they they trying to fight people for not letting them in Red Lobster. <laughs> Bro, they were carrying guns because they couldn't go to the gym. Right. Went to the court. <laughs> we did that. We didn't go to the they go to the bar no more. Yeah. They go get a haircut. Man. Well, I saw a rifle real quick. Listen, life of privilege will do that to you. You get, you know, you, if a little bit of that gets taken away, you 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 act up. And uh, I, I think so. I, I'm going to shift it a little bit. Uh, and Laura Laura Palacio said, uh, or get haircuts. <laughs> hey, some of us a little hair challenged. Um, hey. Learn how to shave it off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I see. I see. You got a. Uh, you got. A, you got us all typecast in here. Uh, <laughs> like, let me find. Let me. Let me find. <laughs> types of <laughs> others. <laughs> um. Yeah. Like. Some great comments here, just about where. Uh, where we are with this black on black crime thing, too. Um. So, one thing I want to ask y'all, just as you know youth serving um people um, but particularly you serving black men right now like um what because i you know i'm not a, i'm not in education direct education but you know i have three black sons and the conversations happening in my house are, are heavy um they all they have been heavy honestly for a long time but right now in particular they're, they're heavy um so i'm just curious if those things are coming up for y'all in these past few weeks, um, wrapping up the school year, wrapping up, um, or even just like with you, David, with um, working with the young, little ones in martial arts and everything. Like, do you find yourselves in these conversations, and in and and what is the nature of those conversations? Um, I I feel like I have. I've definitely been engaging in those conversations with my young people. Um, I always, so I, I, I always need to recognize um, my own positionality as yes, a black person, but a light skinned black person who, who owns his own property and, um, and has a steady job um, and has a community of people in similar positions, right? Um, it just comes with, with, you know, having, you know, this level of education, right? People mostly are, are around like people, right? And so my young people are typically not in that position, right? I work with, with an entirely, um, entirely black population, but uh, um, almost entirely low income. And so for me, what I have tried to do most at this time is just listen. Um, because I know they are providing a completely different perspective than what I could get just tapping into my own um, my own uh, community. Um, and uh, I think the biggest thing that I want to communicate from them, they're, they're listening, they're paying attention. This is the most um, educated generation of all time. And I don't mean educated just in terms of titles, but they have so much information at their fingertips at all times. They are processing much 
that's just available on their smartphones. Mm. They're communicating this and they're developing uh, relationships and movements based off of this. And um, so I think um, I'm always just kind of defensive of them when, when, when my young people are de demonized, especially my black boys. Um, yeah. You know, contrary to popular belief, again, are thinking they are intentional about what they do. Many of them are in situations where they are forced to make some terrible decisions that most of us couldn't even think about making. Right. Mm. Um, but uh, one thing I always share. The my my game banger, bangers also the all, always the ones that say they want to be community leaders. Mm. Um. And and so what I think about is is just like, how can I lift them up and get them to a space where they have personal agency, where they can have impact on their communities, because there's there's so much power amongst them. That's what's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of. Um, like Brian said, they're watching, they're paying attention to what's going on. Um, I think the there's there's the there's a wide spectrum. I think some some of them are, you know, they're resigned to the you know this has been going on. This is just another. This is just another protest. This is just another <laughs> event. You know, we had we, we you know, I didn't seen this before, and so some of them are resigned to the to the fact of what's going on, and and then some want want to be involved in the change. And like you said, they do know more now, and so. They want to be, um, uh, they want to be a part of the solution, and I feel like our our role is to help is to help um, direct that that passion, the anger, that hurt into a positive place, and help them, you know, you know, pull apart some of the, some of that that anger. And to think about what would be most most uh, effective, most most impactful, and try to put them in the best place. Um, it's, kind, it's kind of you know I'm I'm a sports guy. It's kind of like a coach, you know, you know, um, you know you you put your players in best place um, to play, and then you let them you let them do their thing. And so I think that we need to we need to better equip, especially right now. We need to we need to really equip our young people with um, the information, with the tools that they need. So they can make the change. This is they're gonna be the ones that make the change. They're gonna be the one that see this thing through it and cement this change. Mm -hmm. And um because because there will be some backlash for this. There will be, you know, I don't know when it's gonna happen. So just like with Obama and you know, when all uh, all the there will be some my 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 buddy uh, Chris Chapman, he always says systems of systems of, of oppression self correct. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, just like the stock market, there's, there's going to be some self-correction. So um, I think we need to we need to just need to keep doing what we're doing and and um, and really, you know, uh, just do more of it. What's up, man? Yeah, that's real, man. And it's almost like it's already been some blowback because, you know, you've had, what, six hangings in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Um, right, 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 right. But I think. Um, you know, my, my position has been a little bit different, you know, with the karate school, a very, very diverse community, very diverse community. And there'll be moments where all of my students are white. And uh, and so I've, I've felt this, this, this aura of responsibility to recognize that I'm being watched, you know, which we always feel, but um, I've got parents who are wanting to I'll say this, they consciously send their children to our karate school knowing that it's black owned, right? Hmm. And they want their children to have a diverse experience. So these are kids who live in affluent areas, some of them who live in fairly, um, you know, white um, areas where they go to, you know, entirely white schools and such. And they make a conscious decision to send them to our karate school. They could go other places. Um, and so, they do that with the intent of having them be positively impacted. And I honor that, right? Like I recognize that, okay, there's a responsibility that comes with that. And so even though we don't stop class and talk about like, all right, Black Lives Matter, and then punch and kick, um, 
<laughs> but uh, they they watch me on social media. They they know why they're sending their children. It's a very conscious decision. So that's the first step. But also, schools that I used to teach at was predominantly white as well. And I'm seeing this energy of a lot of the young people there wanting to get involved, wanting to be engaged. And some of them have reached out and asked for advice. And to be honest, some of that is exhausting, right? When you get yeah. um, both their parents and, and the young people wanting to know what should we do? Um, mm -hmm. Part of me wants to just say like, you gotta go through the journey, right? Like it's not as if we as all blacks are a monolith. Like, mm -hmm. Point to where I am now from an intellect standpoint, from an awareness standpoint, was not arrived to just because of a lived experience. This was through work and growth, and mistakes, reading, pain. And I feel like right now they have to go through some of that because, as Harold mentioned, the blowback is the fact that they can go out there and protest and yell and holler, but we're going to get the result of it. We're going to get the anger of it. It's yeah. not going to be going back on the white kid who hold up the poster and yelled in the face of the cop. He's going to go take that out of the black, right. right? Or the right. white business owner whose window got shattered by this white kid who was super passionate and excited. <laughs> now he's going to be harder right. and, and meaner against, you know, and more um, uninclusive towards black people. So we always get the brunt of it, right? Mm -hmm. Other groups, other subgroups typically reap the benefits of our protesting before we do. Not mm -hmm. to take anything from them, but it's yeah, very yeah. interesting that DACA yeah, yeah. situation and the LGBTQ situation just all of a sudden, boom, right? And so, and we usually get left like, well, y'all kind of got the lift up from us. And so mm -hmm. I think that, and like, we got some statues. What's up? What's so up? We got some statues. Yeah, <laughs> man. And, um, We've got to keep moving forward, you know, and um, yeah. it's, it's more of us trying to do the right thing than it's not, you know, and I think that that's why something like Surge has been so important because, like, it puts out there, like, we've been doing this. We've been here. We have people of high intellect. More than not, it's college professors in the hood, you know, yeah. and, like, it's it's people like who choose to stay down there and stay with their community, you know, um, so, yeah. That's what's up. I hear that, man. Um, so we had a couple questions that came in. Um, Marshana says she over here snapping. <laughs> uh, she said she wants to hear on what it would look like to support your mental health and or the mental health of black peers and youth while coping with these murders and ongoing racial injustice. So um, it kind of gears me towards where I was going in terms of like, yeah, how do you you know, the some some would say self care, but essentially, how do you um, keep yourself from going crazy during all this, and while simultaneously doing the same for the little ones? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great question right here. I'll jump in real quick. Um, oh, go ahead, Harold. Good. Go ahead. Go ahead, Harold. No, go ahead, Dick. All right. No, so, say. I mean, I say uh, we, we all got manners. We got home training. Yeah, I'm trying to get like you. We're we about to go back and forth. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, one of, one of the things is, you know, you got to take time. You got to – there's there has to be some, some self-awareness. So, you got to kind of feel like when these – when it when it's getting kind of – when you, your emotions are getting, you know, high up, and you know you're ready to take this out on somebody or something, is to 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 unplug. You know, um, I had to unplug Instagram for a minute. You know, I, I've I've been staying off the TV, but there's a difference between you know I noticed Instagram they showing the real videos, and it's a lot of information on Instagram. Um, and versus CNN and, and that kind of thing. So I had to unplug for, for a minute. And, um, you know, I, and I picked up a project. I've been, you know, telling my boys, you know, um, uh, gardening in the lawn, in the, in the front yard, you know, get my grass right, you know. So I go out there every day and, 
you know, water the grass and, you know, that that's a, that's a little bit of peace for me, you know. So um, I think that, you know, us us taking time as professionals, as, you know, we're in, we're always giving, giving, giving. And I think it's for us, it's, it's important for us to be a little bit selfish and make sure that we can take care of ourselves, um, that we can take care of our families um and and we'll be stronger for it you know when when it is time to show up for our young men and our young women and and as far as the mental health component um i think that there, there's just not enough of us right now there's not enough black men that are that that can that are trained that are um that have the education that are even in the educational system um and and brian and david to tell you you know we're targets and we mm -hmm. need we need more black principals we need more black men we need more uh black counselors um you know teachers obviously and i i think that you know having having that system that it's kind of like an hbcu feel you know at one <laughs> of our high schools um at, at my climates you know is you know it's it's a number of black men in the in the in the uh, in the space and so different ones have different strengths and they can speak to different issues that our men are that young men are going through and so I, I think that you know that's important and, and we need to create some systems that keep our black men and cultivate that talent that we have in our communities because right now they just you know they're just in the hood but yeah. they can they are our biggest some of our biggest assets are just sitting in the hood chilling doing nothing mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when we look at mental health, I think there's a lot, a lot to that when we talk about what mental health, what that looks like, um, especially in in, in many re communities that are under resourced. But I, I always start with like the physical outlet. You know what I mean? Like for me, um, stuff like you know coming up playing sports and, and especially martial arts. I think we look at like. Why are our kids so angry? Why are our kids so physical, right? They don't have anywhere to put that energy that gets thrown onto them, right? Like mm -hmm. from a very young age, everywhere they go, you know, they're cute when, until they're five, six, seven, then they hit nine, 10, 11, 12, and they're a threat, you know? Um, and the, the girls are hypersexualized, you know, super young as well. And so all this energy and this pressure that's put on them, they carry that, and then there's no physical outlet for it. And so, um, for me, as far as the, with the youth, I, I really feel like the, the martial arts has been my vehicle to try to help get that out, to get that aggression, get that energy, that focus out, you know. Um, you know, mm -hmm. some people use yoga, some people whatever. And, and I think, you know, there's other cr creative outlets that are important, you know, whether it's music, you know, mm -hmm. like people often wonder, why do, why do our kids dance so well why do they play ball so well why do they rap so well because they got energy to get it out they have they have passion they have anger and yeah. in those moments where it, you know um i think that that's where the the benefit of these outlets happen i mean i know there's a, a rapper in chicago by the name of ad two who started a, um, a mentoring program for teaching young people how to record their own music and stuff like that and i I feel like we need more avenues like that. You know, it, it, not every every not every black man has to be a, a trained therapist, but it could just be taking some young people aside and teaching them a trade, teaching them how to garden, teaching mm -hmm. them um, how to write poetry, whatever. Because that's an outlet. That's time they're doing that that they're not having to sit and think about the reality of the pressure. Right? They can get it out and um, and work through it as opposed to working with it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So. When I, um, yeah, when I, I think when I saw this question, you know, I thought about, um, you know, how do we support ourselves and how do we support our youth on an interpersonal level? And um, so um, for me, it's, it's, it's in the interaction that we have. Well, I, so, so it, it's treating ourselves like human beings for me. Right, humanizing us as much as possible. Um, David said something before in that, um, um, you know, our community is not a monolith. And I think that is one of the most important things 
to internalize when supporting um, our young people. And I'm going to give an example that doesn't seem like it makes sense, but but it does. I, um, you know, I, 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 as a black male educator, I do take, especially, you know, a black male educator who is in the schools, who's not a security guard, which unfortunately mm-hmm. Chicago is yeah, right. pretty than <laughs> yeah. um, we, you would like. I do take some ownership over looking out for um, black males in particular. Um, I've had, you know, mentoring groups. I, I, you know, I, I'm always, I'm a data person. I'm always tracking how my black males are doing in comparison to the rest of the school. I had a young man that I had been working with for a couple of years, had a pretty good relationship with him. And I was getting him signed up for, um, for a mentoring, prestigious mentoring program here in the city, um, actually run by another um, Surge fellow. Um, and he needed a letter of recommendation. So I've been helping him through the mentorship process. And so I just knew he was gonna ask me for a letter of recommendation. I was ready, I already started writing it. Uh, so I'm like, all right, let, all right Laquan, letter of recommendation. Yeah, I just want you to know I got you. He like, nah, I'm gonna ask, and I can't even remember um, this woman's name for lack of a better term. I'm going to say Miss Laura Beth. Um, <laughs> like, no, I'm going to ask Miss Laura Beth. I said, Miss Laura Beth, I'm like, you you applied for a mentorship program for black and brown males. You don't want me? Like, I had a relationship with you. You're like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to ask Miss Laura Beth. You know, like, we have good conversations. Miss Laura Beth, the nerdiest looking white woman <laughs> in your life. I was like, yeah. I was like, oh. I was like, okay. (laughs) You know, whatever that she was pouring into him was what he needed. Yeah. And it connected to him. Right. Now there, there's plenty of other kids who, um, who connect with me. I consider myself a pretty good youth worker. Um, and plenty of other kids who connect with me, um, who, who accept what I'm pouring into them. Um, but for any practitioner, anybody who's working with black young people, um treat them as human beings mm. never it, it doesn't matter who you are although i you know again i i think the it is the black educators are extremely important but pour into them what you have with with authenticity um and treat them as as the human beings that they are um so that they have the agency to grow in whatever <laughs> that that in connect in whatever direction that um that makes sense to them. And I think that helps um, them, you know, grow with their mental health. Brian, can I ask you a question? I know I'm not yeah. the moderator. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, because especially since you've been a black male teacher in, in predominantly black environments, would you also say that there's times where there's been black ed- educators who've been more destructive than helpful? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So the short answer is yes. That, that absolutely happens. Um, I got checked. Uh, well, I don't say checked. I, I, I'll say called in by Carmita. Uh, Ooh, hey, that's scary. I, I was. Um, I was at the beginning of the fellowship. I was. I was very frustrated with some of the black educators that I was around. Um, and you know, Carmita had to you know, trying to kind of call me in. It's like they're dealing with their hurt, too. They are educating and, you know, even loving in in the way that they know how and the way that they're taught. And and they're often doing that because they don't know any other way themselves. Right. Um, So I have seen plenty of destruction from fellow black educators. Um, and we need to be held accountable for the harm that we cause to our young people, but that's often coming from a place of harm. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's important to do that self work so that we don't reflect our own trauma onto our young people. And yeah. as I said before, yeah. offering space for them to grow and them to have agency in the world as it, um, makes sense to them. Yeah. That's real talk. Yeah. That's what's up, man. Appreciate you building on that. And yeah, like 
the moderator title is in name only. We can we can hop in and and, and ask each other's questions as much as we want. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, this question and then we'll we'll um, shift a little bit as we start to wrap up. Um, so, and Brian, you kind of, I think you touched on this in your response to the other question, but uh, Tony, who's a uh, educator, um, just asked a question, uh, any thoughts on how educators can best support our black students throughout all this upheaval? Um, and so specific during this time, I don't know if y'all have any advice to fellow uh, educators. Um, Brian, you already shared a little bit um, in terms of your perspective on that. Is there anything you two, you other two want to build on that? Um, I think that uh, I like what Brian said is, is listen. Yeah. Listen, you know, um, listen at what, you know, let them speak, you know, um, find out, find out what's, what's going on with them. You know, um, it, it's hard to, it's hard to help somebody if you don't, you know, it's like, you're kind of like a doctor, you know, a doctor has to, you know, you got to answer some questions first, you know, before he can diagnose you and try to offer some support. So um, I think listening is, is huge um, for, I mean, there's some of us that, and I, that's why, you know, I think it's so important that black men be in, be in side of the school system is because we know we we will listen, but we also know we've been through these situations before. So um, the speed in which that we can react and we can support is is a little bit different. Yeah. And so um, I think that I think listening is I think that's the that's the best thing to do. And and then support support not what you think is um, can be helpful, but support what based on what you heard provide the support based on what you heard mm -hmm. yeah I, I can echo that you know what i mean like there's that saying that like everything we need to heal us is already here you know and so i think sometimes and i'm guessing this question is coming from somebody who's looking at it like if they're not a member of the black community how right. can you, you know sincere don't come in assuming that stuff hasn't already been done or yeah. that the resources or tools to fix the issues are not already there and they just need to be tapped into right there's a lot of undeveloped uncultured potential in our communities or work that gets overlooked right the savior's complex is very real you know you know i mean and i think that like like you know harold mentioned ask ask the right questions ask what help is already being done ask what they want don't prescribe Right. Don't tell them what they need. Ask them what they want. Um, and then once you ask them that, respond accordingly. Right. Um, and I think too often people from outside lens come in and say, oh, man, they need this. Oh, I know what they need. And they go rally and they work really hard to get it. And then they deliver it. And the people who get it are like, I'm not. And then they get upset. They get their feelings get hurt because they had the best of intentions. Right. But they didn't have the best of process. You know, and I think that the process has to be like one thing I've learned from surgeons, learning the ecosystem, right? Like really learning and studying the ecosystem or you can miss the mark. Um, and we have to stop looking at the black community as a charity case. We have to stop looking at black kids as already downtrodden. They're kids, Brian mentioned, they're human beings that are products of the environments that were built to destroy them already. So they're doing exactly when they when you see them struggling, that's because they were that's what the environment was meant to do, right? And so they have an illness because you've been feeding them unhealthy food for a long time. So let's look at where the food is being grown, you know what I mean, and what's being put into them, and then start there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm, appreciate it, brother. Um, there's been a, a little bit of dialogue happening in the comments around uh, someone asked a question about black on black crime. Um, they may have ju jumped in a little late because we we did talk about it. Yeah, we, we covered that one, man. Damn, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the dialogue in the comments is, I think, addressing that question. Um, just pointing out um, a couple really poignant comments uh, that some folks have left here in response to that question. Uh, you know. 
a lot of I think I struggle with the idea that that we keep circling back to that. This this it's funny that this we have a microcosm of that in our comment session where we talked about it earlier it, it, in the fact that it keeps coming up and then it comes up again. <laughs> You just, keep um, saying, you just keep saying it one, uh, you know. Uh, eventually, you you gonna believe it. Just they just yeah. keep saying it. Just keep saying it. Yeah. What's crazy now is that like, like in the last few weeks, I've had more black people I'm associated with come out with that rhetoric. I'm like, man, like we are conditioned to buy into it because it's convenient. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You start demonizing your own. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I will say that I think sometimes it comes from a place of genuine concern about the community. And so when you see, because the media spins this narrative that black people aren't caring about the violence, the intra-community violence in our communities, I think sometimes, unfortunately, that trickles down into our communities and, and, and so that sometimes our people believe it. And so, you know, in that type of situation, I mean, again, I, I, I maybe just because I'm a little plugged in, I try to plug them in. I was like, hey, this is happening. 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 All to address the roots of the violence in our communities. I promise you, fam, that <laughs> people care. Um, so, you know, I always try to like it when it when it's a ner negative narrative that our people are, have internalized. I always try to try to get to the root of why that they have internalized it. Um, instead of, you know, I, I, I don't want to sit with that frustration because we need everybody. If we're going to get change, we can't just dismiss people because, right. you know, they don't have the exact right mindset. But we still gonna hold you accountable because that, that's yeah. that's a BS. Right. <laughs> that's the challenge, though, right? Like. The, the the juggling between having to educate and have to protect your own <laughs> safety, right uh, I actually had a uh, that happened when I uh, my, uh, my oldest son who just joined Facebook earlier uh, this year um, is kind of getting used to the social media environment and um we had somebody who was a friend of the family a, a white woman uh i he, he he let me know that she he unfriended her and i was like why'd you unfriend her uh and he said well she asked this question like about like what is white privilege and uh my first thought was like oh well you know i mean maybe we have an opportunity to educate her you know what i'm saying like she's asking the question uh, but my son, being who he is, kindly left out all the vulgarities and uh, the framing of that question. <laughs> so when I went and saw what she actually posted, I hit that unfriend button, too. <laughs> so, hey, you know, that's interesting. Like right. you said that, like thinking about the, what your son did, which props to your son. He's a product of you, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But like I was reading, my wife was telling me something about what, what uh, a statement by ta Coates. Coates. Um, yesterday she was talking about him about how like black people we constantly feel almost like we need to save white people for themselves almost like let's help them get there you know and like arrive and then we exhaust a lot of energy you know talking to them and suggesting books and tempering the way we say things but like yo we could put that energy towards our own sanity because we go do that and exhaust ourselves and then we be going crazy. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and be tired and don't have energy for our families, to look at our kids, our own communities. And so I think there has to be a balance. I mean, there's I think there's white people who are very sincere in the process and, and they want it. And I think that that's needed. Um, but we also have to, sometimes we have to be like, man, look, it's not my job to be your therapist. <laughs> like, you, you know, like right. you've been living in this country for how long, too? You college educated too. You got access to resources too. You mm -hmm. better start reading. <laughs> you better like, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's what's up. Harold, where do you sit on this uh kind of tension between have you know educating the folks and kind of having to just <laughs> turn the other way? <laughs> There's a lot yeah. in that book, brother. <laughs> yeah, no, um, 
see the so my my sister she she called so my sister she went to a white high school she went to a white high school with you know just to you know some folks that are uh you know less than um let me let me try I was gonna say clue and just say it so um, and and well I, you know I'm I don't wanna put her out but um you know, she asked she asked me to be on the call, and I was like, "Man, no, no, because let them go do the work first. Go do the work first. Don't just come asking the question. Go do the work first, and then come holler at me. Let me know that you're invested in what we're talking about, and you're invested in the actual solution. So, um, and that's why you know, I, I there's another brother who you know went to elementary school with. We both we came from the same hood, and you know he's 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 the he's the male candace owens right now oh my god uh, he's, yeah. he's on facebook man i it just it, it just blew me away now now i am you know because i have a relationship with him and i know where he comes from so i give him a little a uh, pass on like let, let me figure you let me try to see where your head is brother because something happened i don't know what it is something, something happened um <laughs> Yeah, it, it was. It was. I don't know when it was, but it was. It was some middle school, high school. Um, but yeah. So you no, know, I I don't have time for them conversations. You know what I'm saying? I don't have time for the conversations. Um, if if it's something from somebody from my community that I know, that I trust, and then you know, there I think there is there is a time for education. I think. You know, we all been lied to. You know, we're all in the same school system. We all been told the same lie about Columbus Day. I mean, I think most people, if you told them the truth, um, I don't know if you, if you guys have seen um, what's that movie, Invading America? So it's, it's Michael Moore. He does his documentary, goes across the world, and they go look at um, you know how different you know countries do things. And so one of the things they go to Germany and this is elementary school kids and they paint a scenario for them um uh, they're like in second or third grade and they saying okay tonight you are to go home pack a bag get one sandwich get one toy you're leaving everything there you're not coming back to anything you're leaving your place and you're going to so they paint this whole scenario where the kids understand you know, just a small piece of uh, of the Holocaust. And so so these kids grow up like, oh, man, that ain't cool. Like, I don't want that to happen again. And so they get it early, but they tell the truth about it, though. And so here we don't tell the truth about it. And so nobody nobody knows where to go because nobody's told nobody's been told what the truth is. And so, um, you know, I think we all got to figure out, you know, what the real is and you know I, I just jumped on i don't know if you brothers have seen hidden colors um by uh tariq nasheed mm -hmm. um but he has he has five different five different uh you know documentaries around black history and, and it ain't just starting with slavery i mean going all the way back and so um some of that stuff it's just it's just crazy the the the, the different lies we've been told the half truths and um and and you know we need that those need to be correct that needs to be a curriculum that needs to be embedded in the system and that's the only way that this is gonna things are gonna change and um and, and that change to be cemented and to be um part of the system yeah, that's yeah Chris, I think harold says something so important like he what he's talking about like harold is still going through his own journey of process of education right and so when whites come to us wanting us to like Coach them up. We still are trying to grow ourselves and understand ourselves. This whole dilemma that we've been miseducated about, and it might take us an entire lifetime to really understand what's truly happening to us and educate our own children. Mm -hmm. and so, for us to be in the still the stages of education and awareness, and then be trying to educate others on where they're at, that's a lot of work. Yeah. And sometimes I think we have to, when we talk about mental right. health, we have to like say, oh, you know what? Not today, because I'm trying to work on me. I'm trying to understand this myself. I don't understand why this this keeps happening either. I got my theories, but I really don't understand all of it. Yeah. And so, yeah. The, yeah. the single 
the single biggest thing that I picked up from the surge experience is recognizing that that I am also as a black person, I'm also one of the people who needs to be okay. Like it's mm-hmm. the people that I serve. I uh the the, the first night at surge retreat, we got good food. Ooh. I never <laughs> my mind as an educator, I, I should be in a space educator of you know low income young black you know we we not even allowed to be fed in Chicago public schools so uh so but but to the notion that I deserved that yeah um, that's real I, it's, it's, it's something real. simple but it never crossed my mind it, it and yeah. so like we can we can give and give and give and i have a lot of energy to give don't get me wrong but um it's defeating the purpose if i as a black person myself is suffering as a result of what i'm giving right mm. it's heavy. right right, That's right. man uh, and i'll i'll take that moment to do a a surge plug because uh I think I saw that Sasha's watching. <laughs> uh, Carmita. Sasha, uh, Carmita, yeah, Carmita has entered the chat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, it's good uh, for a good plate. They give you a good plate. Listen, that yeah. good plate is is a uh, is is <laughs> kind of a microcosm conversation we have all the time about what it means to what what does the surge experience mean, uh, and and a big part of it is not saying like, oh, we're gonna you know uh give all this knowledge and blah 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 it's it's more so like um creating a space where we can recognize we're already worthy we're Mm. already um leaders we are already powerful and strong Mm -hmm. and um i think like uh sasha always brings it up as as that example of like it was important to have to have hot meals you know at the search gathers because you know, like you just said, a lot of folks have said that, and as educators, that's not the norm. Um, that 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 isn't even on the table, um, and so I feel like that's a good um, example of how we could potentially break the table and build our own. And in that and, and at that table, it is hot meals. <laughs> um, You're right. But yeah, there's a lot going on over here in the comments. I don't know if y'all seeing it too, but there's a little bit of back and forth. Um, but I'll just kind of sum it up in saying that folks are um, are 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 kind of clapping back at this idea of you know the problems within our communities is somehow the result of our communities, and that you know this black on black crime constantly coming up. I, 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 I was doing a little investigator. I don't think he was. That's the old scuba Steve looking. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he was. Really awesome. yeah. Yeah. He's he he's not our people. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he one of my followers though, man. What's man? Is that what you said? Is he, he's one of your followers? I'm asking. I, I can't see the chat. But oh I'm hoping, no, I, 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 yeah. I highly doubt it. <laughs> Uh, so, hey, listen, like this is the, you know, we, we, we have the, when they come for us conversation and it's essentially like when people start ducking in and, and kind of trying to pick apart this movement and what we're trying to do, um, then we must be doing something right. Um, and so I, I'm happy to see the dialogue that's happening and the folks that are engaging and saying like, no, that ain't it. <laughs> um, right. so as we, uh, is what it is. As we wrap up, uh, I just put this 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 one up here from Jenna. Um, Caring for myself is not self indulgent; it is self preservation, and that is an act of political warfare, Madre Lord. Um, I think that uh, I want to close this off with the question of what are you doing to kind of um, just build beyond. And I'm I'm really segueing for an easy plug for Dave to talk about his music. But if y'all have things that y'all want to talk about as well, um, <laughs> feel, feel free. Because um, I, I have some things I can share about as well. Oh, Dave froze. 
Oh no! <laughs> right, right at the oh, moment. <laughs> this is your time to shine, brother. Yeah, right. Right. He's like uh, that's, M&M the, M&M that's, M&M. that's the feds. That's the feds. <laughs> he, was, he was about to get some fire. Yeah, yeah. They, he was about to get some is. fire. Okay, he's back, he's he came back. in and said, "We weren't ready." Okay. Right. Hey, brother, it, it froze exactly. literally, but exactly. I threw it to you. Exactly. <laughs> um, he need to get in the studio like you, uh, Chris. Yeah, there it is. Uh, <laughs> so, David, I was giving you opportunity right, right, right. to talk a little bit about your music. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear us. What's up? <laughs> I was giving you opportunity to talk about your music. I was talking about like how do we compress? How do we? What are we doing to kind of creatively um, build? And uh, I was get, I was going to give you space to share a little bit about um, what you do musically. Oh man, I can't hear y'all. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna try to get on my phone. All right, all right, we'll 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 figure it out. Uh, in the meantime, um, one thing I do want, uh, just if y'all brothers want to share, um, what kind of art are you taking in? So this is something I asked on a live stream I was on a couple of weeks ago, and I got it, it was it really interesting. And that means beyond you know music or anything like that, um, movies. Uh, TV shows, what's helping you kind of escape? If you're not doing TV like Brother Harold here, um, what is kind of helping you um, sort of reconfigure, recontextualize what's going on? For example, I rewatched Do the Right Thing a couple weeks ago and it felt it hit me in a weird way. <laughs> um, where, where are y'all at with that? Man, my neighbors, my neighbor came to me, you know, I, I got, I got a, you know, Caucasian neighbor that came to me. He said, yeah, man, we, we we have movie night and, you know, the kids are uh, teenagers now. So, you know, we got a little crazy. We go to R-rated movies, so we watch Do the Right Thing. Oh, and, snap. I mean, his, face, <laughs> his face lit up, man. It was, he said, my, so wife, my wife's like, man, I can't believe it. That That's exactly what just happened. I, I, I just, I can't believe it. And so it, it was just, you know, it's, it's just funny, man. Um <laughs> Yeah, no, I, you know, like I told you, I, I'm watching, um, I'm watching Hidden Colors, and I'm gonna tell Carmita's in here. You need to put that a part of the curriculum. I need to dive <laughs> in and stick that in somewhere. They got five of them. I'm on, I'm on three, and so, um, you know, and then you know, I, I got kids, man. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure that it, it is tough. I find it difficult to you know, um, navigate where, where I have a seven and a four year old. So, you know, they, their attention to what's going on. They hear some of my conversations. Um, I'm at, you know, I'm working from home now, so they hear some of zoom calls. And so, you know, where to insert them into the conversation fully and, um, you know, not to stress, you know, how, how not to bring them too much stress but so they're aware of like what's going on, you know? And so it's, it's, it's been a fine line and like, you know, how much to tell them, you know, how much to expose them to, um, at this age. And, um, that's something that, you know, I've been kind of working, working on, working with me and the yeah. wife is, and, you know, Juneteenth, obviously the celebration stuff is cool, but you know, all the other stuff is, is, um, is, is important, man. Right on. About you, Brian. Um, so I'm gonna be honest, like I don't watch I don't consume no type of like black trauma cinema. I've never seen like you know, people talk about, oh yeah, you gotta watch this, this, and this. No. It, I, it's enough in real life. <laughs> <laughs> That's that right. I deal with, um, for me, right, right, right. for others, that's that's empowering, right? For to see their experiences um, on screen is empower, empowering. I, but for me personally, like, um, you know, I have a. I think it's unfortunate. So much of black media that's get play that gets play is about our suffering. So I be watching like sci-fi and stuff. I like I like imagining. A different world. I've been watching. I've been watching uh, uh, more Star Trek. Um, What's up? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I watch, you know, I watch fantasy stuff, things that 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 help me imagine something. Uh, some. Um, we yeah, talk I, mean, about I, I, I don't have a. I mean, I'm not woke in uh, the media, <laughs> or most of the music that I consume. Quite frankly. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's what's up, man. I uh, have you watched The Expanse? I have seen some of The Expanse. I have not watched all of the. Expanse. Get a little further in. It's it's a it's a pretty dope show. I'll just say okay. that. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna try to finish it. Yeah, what you got, David? Now that you're uh, <laughs> situated, I don't even know what the question was. I feel like <laughs> been all all for the past like five minutes. Uh, I like that orange background though, man. That's kind of cool. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I'll just ask about your art, your music, um, if you want to share a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, um, I released my first uh, hip hop album in, in 2016. Um, I would not suggest going and listening to it because I was not that good. Um, <laughs> lyrically, I was there. Lyrically, I was there, but my delivery and stuff has definitely grown. Um, it was a, a album that was actually based on the symbolism of the Hunger Games. Um, so um, it's been a growth journey. I really felt like it was another platform for me to be a teacher um, and reach more people. And since then, I've just been trying to grow as an artist, um, as a creative outlet. So I've released three projects. My most recent, um, American Fiction, which I would suggest go listen to. It's on um, any streaming platform. I go by the name Brother News with a Z. Um, and I'm currently working on actually about four or five small projects, um, just trying to continue growing. You know, once once Corona hit, I uh, finally invested in my own recording equipment um, and just started using it as a way to kind of escape, um, you know, when the kids are down and, and such. So try to maintain positivity, try to maintain integrity, because I know that I've got former students who listen, I've got parents who listen, but even like for my kids, you know, I want to be able to put something out there. Um, but sometimes like Brian mentioned, like sometimes I feel like sometimes I just got to un, un, um, un, like tap out from like the 100% pro black all the time. I can't always be about to struggle because it'll wear you out. And so every now and then um, I do listen to something grimy like Griselda or um, right now I'm actually working on a project where it's like comic book theme, um, I'm kind of going under like a um, like in character um, of like this samurai um, vigilante that like goes after corruption, racial corruption. So, so you know, sometimes you gotta do that kind of stuff to take your mind out. You know, what I mean, like we have to go into sci-fi. We have to, you know, like just to to breathe. You know, mm -hmm. read a little bit. So, yeah, I'm really enjoying the music process, and uh, I'm finally creating some stuff that my wife thinks is decent. Dang! Mm -hmm. <laughs> she always thought I was lyrically good, but she would always be like, "Yeah, you know, it's all right." Yeah, I hate, I hate her in the household. <laughs> <laughs> She's an English. Yeah. Professor. She's an English professor, so she'll be like, "That was good." Oh, but, she on yeah. your helmet, then, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, like two days ago, I finally made something. She was like, "Wow, this is really good," and I was like, "I right. like you know what I'm saying? Like, I ain't making no money off of it. So if my wife thinks it's dope, I'm happy. You know what Man. I'm saying? Let's go. So there you go. Yeah. Hey, your people, they be your toughest critics, but that's a that's a good thing because that sharpens you. You know, grading my my raps like essay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got a red mark. Um. All right. Well, I think on that note, we're gonna go ahead and um. Sign off. I just want to thank everybody who joined us, even the folks with dissenting views, so to speak, um, because it just provoked more, more conversation. Um, I really want us to continue uh, this kind of dialogue in different ways. Um, so we're going to do more of these um, and just really bring folks together and have conversations about where we're at, uh, whether we're, you know, transitioning out of COVID and into whatever the next thing is for this crazy 2020, uh, we wanna have space for folks to, to to share and talk about it. So I appreciate all three of y'all too, taking the time to be a part of this. 
Um, I can't tell if we lost Harold or if he just if his uh, camera just went off, but I'm assume he's still there. Um, but appreciate you for this opportunity, man, this was great. Yeah, pre do appreciate it. It's therapeutic, bro. Like real talk. I know, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love you know having these kind of conversations. I, 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 I'm hoping we get to a place where we can um, chop it up about you know more fun things, <laughs> but also felt the need to to dive into what we dived into tonight. So um, if anybody uh, who's on the stream watch this, um, please feel free to share it. Uh, this will become a video once I sign off so you can share it with folks and they can rewatch it um, and engage with it. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, thanks to y'all three. Um, and if you are new to Surge, have not uh, engaged with us in the past, please you know, follow us on social media and um, to, to see the next Shades of Impact um, live stream is, as well as some of our other content. Uh, we love kind of building spaces and having dialogue. So um, thank you, everyone, um, and have a good night. All right. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate you, bro. Nice to see y'all, brothers.